Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this mesh energy presentation on are heat pumps the right choice, when and when not to use heat pumps. So my name is David Reed. I am one of the mechanical and electrical design engineers here at Mesh Energy. Um, we will talk a little bit more about um, about mesh as we go through. Uh, so this first slide, obviously, if you're here, then you're already on mesh work um, and you're watching this live. Um, so this is more for the benefit of those that might be watching later on YouTube. Um, mesh work is our free um, online platform um, for discussing all things um, related to energy efficiency and renewable technologies. Um, it's completely free to sign up. Um, so that's how you get to watch these webinars live. So what we're going to cover in today's webinar is a little bit of introduction, a um, little bit about Mesh Energy, who we are, what we do, um, where we've come from, a look at the energy hierarchy um, and what that is and, and how it applies, a little bit about um, some of the different technologies um, that we're looking at with heat pumps, so that's ground source and air source. And then we'll go on to a little bit more of the tech. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the myths around heat pumps. Um, we do see quite a lot of myths being repeated um, and a lot of these things aren't true. Um, so we're just going to bust a few myths. Um, then we're going to look at some of the applications, um, some of the opportunities and some of the risks um, that you might encounter on, on particular projects, um, both for new build and renovation. Then there's a sort of list of big do's and don'ts. Um, which hopefully is sort of quite a, a useful refer, tool to refer back to in the future. And then finally, we'll have a little bit of time where we'll talk, take, go through some of the key points, um, a little bit about how you can work with Mesh Energy um, and about where, where we get involved in projects and how we, how we work as a consultancy business. And then finally, at the end, there'll be some time for questions. As I say, this isn't the longest of our presentations, so I'd hope that it'll take about 40 minutes to run through the presentation. Um, and at the end of that, we'll, we'll pick up all the questions um, at the end. So who are Mesh? Uh, well, we're a small independent energy consultancy. We're based in Farnham and Surrey in the UK. Um, and um, our sort of role is um, to help architects and our customers um, to sort of demystify and clarify the um, green energy landscape and, and deliver, you know, sort of outstanding projects really that, that have the best combination of renewable um, and low energy technologies. Um, so we want to instill confidence um, in those technologies and pride in the outcome um, that comes, comes from that. And we do that through hopefully intelligent design um, and selecting the right, the right tool for the right job. Um, one of the things I will stress is we are independent of any particular technology. Um, so we're not aligned to any particular manufacturers. We're not aligned to any particular products. Um, that doesn't mean, of course, that we don't all have our favorite products that we like to, you know, that we, we specify on a regular basis. You know, obviously familiarity um, is, is obviously useful. Um, but what we'll try and do is we'll always try and find the best product for that particular application. So let's talk a little bit about the energy hierarchy. Um, most, I know a lot of you will have been on many of our webinars and will have seen this slide or a similar slide many, many times before. Um, but really what it talks about is it talks about how to take um, a building from first principles all the way through to delivery and at what level to start considering different things. So, probably the biggest single thing that we can do to improve the energy performance of a building is to actually make the building appropriate to its surroundings. Um, and that can be through, um, first of all, the selection of the, the correct orientation, the correct location on the site. Um, you know, you might be lucky enough that you have a site that's big enough that you can actually choose where the building goes on the site. Um, but things like orientation of windows, um, you know, having a large south facing window for example might mean the building's more prone to overheating um so so moving away from some of those um, mistakes early in the design process can really help further down the line then it's talking about uh, passive design you know what things can we do without adding technology how can we improve the insulation how can we improve the uh, ventilation how can we reduce um 
the materials that we use um, to make them more efficient. Then internal loads, you know, especially when, when it's looking at cooling, for example, reducing internal loads um, can really help to, uh, to drive down um, the energy consumption. And then we start looking at some of the more um, energy, um, uh, some of the more sort of technological things. So um, things like heat recovery, renewables, and then eventually um, working into sort of zero carbon solutions. So here's our house. Um, we've obviously looked at the whole fabric. We've tried to insulate as well as we can. Um, in this case, if it was a retrofit, obviously you can't change the orientation. Um, you probably can't change the openings a huge amount, but you can at least insulate properly. Um, you could look at things like, the, you know, on this, on this building, obviously you've got a little chimney up here. You know, is that chimney actually serving something or could it be blocked up um, to reduce ventilation losses? Those kind of things. Um, so we'd always say before adding a low carbon technology, consider all the fundamental things you can do to reduce um, the energy of uh, reduce the energy consumption and um, you know and those things have obviously got to be reasonably practicable um, but generally speaking they're relatively cheap to do and they will give you um, and they'll they'll pay back you know time and time and time again so let's look a bit more about uh, heat pumps so this is a, a very basic refrigeration cycle um, so heat comes into the refrigeration cycle um, over here on the uh, on on the left hand side of the drawing, um, so your heat is coming in here. It goes into the evaporator, um, and the evaporator, as the name suggests, um, turns the liquid refrigerant into a gas. Uh, so that gas is still at quite a low temperature, quite a low pressure. It comes up here into the compressor. Um, now, if any of you have ever held your finger over the end of a bicycle pump and then pumped, what you'll notice is the, the bike pump gets hot and that's what the compressor is doing. So it's effectively acting like your bicycle pump. Um, so what you get out of the other side of the compressor is a high pressure um, uh, gas, uh, which is also uh, at high temperature. What we then do is we then pass this high pressure gas through the condenser. Um, and at that point, the heat is taken out of the refrigeration cycle, and that is where your that your home is on this side of the refrigeration cycle, or your building. Um, that hot gas then condenses back into a liquid. So actually, that's wrong. That should be a liquid, and comes back through here through an expansion valve. And the best way of thinking of an expansion valve is if you take a can of deodorant, um, the liquid inside the can of deodorant is at room temperature. But when you spray it under your arm, it feels pretty cold. And the reason is that you've expanded that liquid because it's under pressure in, in the can. And as you spray it out, it actually gets cold because you're doing the opposite of what you're doing. With your bicycle pump, you're expanding um, the liquid. And so it comes back up here again as a subcooled liquid, ready to pick up more heat from the environment and go around the cycle again. So hopefully that uh, explains the refrigeration cycle um, and here it is in words, um, but I'm not going to dwell on this because uh, hopefully you've now kind of got the idea. But the, the sort of key component, the four key components are the evaporator, the compressor, the condenser and the expansion valve. And if you have an air conditioning system, you have exactly the same thing. Um, the only difference is that the left hand side of this diagram would be where your house is and the right hand side would be where the outside environment is. So a heat pump and an air conditioning system are one and the same technology. They're just operating in, in the opposite, um, opposite way. So an air source heat pump um, basically is taking its, uh, its heat from outside the building, from the air, and it's then turning that heat into uh, into useful uh, low you know taking it from low grade fairly useless heat into and turning it into high grade useful heat um, which you can then use for space heating domestic hot water um, swimming pools work really really well with with the heat pumps because the obviously swimming pool water doesn't need to be particularly hot um, you know typically a sort of um, 28 29 degrees would be absolutely perfect for a swimming pool um, 
And because you get this free heat from the environment, um, the amount of electricity you need to put in to get each um, each unit of heat out is um, is really low. So typically for an air source heat pump, over averaged over a year, you'll get between um, an efficiency of 250 and 400%. So for every kilowatt hour of electricity you put into the heat pump, you'll get between two and a half and four kilowatt hours of heat out of the heat pump. Um, and the actual amount of the, the efficiency of that conversion is based on the ambient air temperature, um, the heat you actually want in the water, um, so the, the hotter you make the water, the less efficient the system is, and obviously the design of the actual heat pump itself um, you know, will, will have an effect. So generally speaking, high efficiency heat pumps tend to be um, you know, from, the, from the sort of bigger, more established brands. Uh, we're going to look at three um, types of ground source heat pump. And as I go through this, this sort of master slide, you'll see that the, uh, the diagram on the right hand side here will change. Um, but basically, a ground source heat pump works in exactly the same way. It just uses a different heat source. So the, the, the most common heat source are these horizontal ground loops. And what you have is you have a mixture of uh, water and glycol going around these loops. Um, so um, so they're picking up um, heat from the ground. The ground is a relatively stable temperature. Um, you, so you put these, these loops about 1.2 meters down into the ground and that acts as your heat source. Um, as the sun shines on the ground, it heats the ground up um, and that, you know, so effectively it just works as like a giant um, sort of solar um, battery, if you like, and the ground heats up over the summer and you, you extract that heat out during the winter. Again, uh, ground source heat pump is powered by electricity, but because you get this um, this stable um, ground temperature, uh, you will um, you'll get a slightly better efficiency. Um, so this this second diagram here, you can see we've got vertical boreholes. Um, advantage of vertical boreholes is they take up less physical space um, in plan view than than the horizontal loops in the first diagram, um, but they are more expensive. Um, you get similar efficiencies. But what you can get from vertical boreholes is you get space heating, domestic hot water, and they're, they're good for indoor swimming pools. Um, for outdoor swimming pools, generally speaking, we tend to recommend air source heat pumps rather than ground source, um, simply because at the times of year, you're likely to be using an, out, an outdoor swimming pool. Um, you're going to have lots of uh, free heat from the air. Um, so it makes sense um, to, to use that heat um, and the cheaper technology, which, which, is a, which is an air source heat pump. And finally, um, we've got this open loop um, ground source. So here you're taking groundwater out of the ground, passing it through the heat pump and rejecting slightly cooler groundwater back into the ground. But again, similar kind of thing. So with all these systems, you'll get a COP of between about three and five. And again, that really depends on the design of the heat pump and um, the temperature of the water that you want to use um, in the home. So the lower the temperature um, of the water you're wanting to use around the home uh, or in the building, um, the higher the efficiency will be. So your heat pumps having to do less work to sort of effectively amplify this, um, this low grade heat into high grade heat. So let's look at a few of the myths around heat pumps and debunk some of these myths. So we'll start with air source heat pumps. Um, this is a fairly typical looking air source heat pump here. Um, so you've got all your gubbins in, in the right hand side of the, uh, the heat pump and then you've got the evaporator uh, with a fan um, on the left hand side where you can see behind that grill. So myth one is air source heat pumps are really noisy. Um, this simply isn't true. Um, most air source heat pumps that are available on the market today um, have a lower um, sound power than your typical dishwasher. Um, so they're really, really quite quiet. And you've got to remember these are outside as well. Um, so where do people find they get issues with noise? Because, you know, you do occasionally get issues with noise. And it's generally where heat pumps have been 
either undersized, so the fan is having to work really hard all the time, and the majority of the noise you hear is from the fan. Um, sometimes it's from heat pumps that are actually damaged, um, so they've got things stuck in the fan, for example, so it's actually a mechanical noise you can hear rather than the actual heat pump. Um, and sometimes it's, it's through um, poor uh, acoustic planning. Um, so for example, in this, in this example, you can see we've got a brick wall behind the heat pump, uh, which would reflect um, noise pretty effectively because it's a hard surface. Um, but you'll see in the front of the heat pump, so the air would be coming out of the heat pump um, towards the left of the slide. Um, if you put a hard surface in front of that, it will tend to reverberate noise and can make the noise appear worse than it actually is. So some careful thinking about you know, having some soft planting. So here they've put soft planting around the heat pump. Um, so that can be quite good because it will help um, absorb any noise. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a good thing to do. But as a general rule, air source heat pumps are not noisy. Um, myth number two is that air source heat pumps don't work properly in cold weather. Um, it's certainly true that the output of a, an air source heat pump will drop with ambient temperature. Um, simple physics tells you that's the case. There is less energy available in the air. Um, but if you size the heat pump correctly, it will provide the heat you require um, throughout the year. Um, most air source heat pumps are designed to work down to a temperature of around minus 25 degrees um, Celsius. Um, so that's absolutely fine for, for anywhere in the UK. Um, Obviously, if you are living in northern Scandinavia or somewhere, um, then you might need to consider some sort of backup heating uh, for the very, very um, harsh conditions you get in some of those places. Um, but generally speaking, that's why in northern Scandinavian countries, they tend to go for ground source heat pumps rather than air source. Um, myth three is that the fan units need to go on the roof or near to the house or building. Uh, again, that's not true. Um, most air source heat pumps can be situated within about uh, 15 to 25 meters of the building they're serving. Um, and as I said, the normal reason that people give for wanting to have the heat pump further from the building um, is because of noise, uh, but actually noise isn't really too much of a consideration if you do a little bit of uh, sensible planning. Uh, myth number four, heat pumps can't do hot water. Um, it's just not true. Heat pumps will quite happily produce um, domestic hot water. Um, the newer heat pumps, uh, which have the, some of the newer refrigerants, can do hot water up to about 55 degrees C. Um, most heat pumps um, will produce hot water to around 45. Um, so what you do is you, you slightly increase the size of your domestic hot water cylinder to, um, to cope with that. Um, what you can't do with a heat pump, and where this you know most of these myths have some element of truth in them um is that they you can't replace a combi boiler um with an air source heat pump there's no sort of air source combi type system um available um so you will always have to have some sort of domestic hot water cylinder and myth number five is they don't work with radiators um again this isn't true um heat pumps will work perfectly happily with radiators you just need to make sure that your radiator sizing is correct. Um, and again, you're wanting to reduce the flow temperature coming from the heat pump as far as you can to maximize the, co the coefficient of performance, that COP, the efficiency. Um, so that might mean you have to uprate a few radiators. It might mean that you maybe go for um, some, some big um, double or triple finned um, radiators rather than um, the conventional um, sort of single finned radiators that you might have had uh, with the with the boiler system but as long as you size the system correctly they will work quite happily with radiators so let's have a look at some of the myths surrounding ground source heat pumps um, many of them are similar to those that you see with air source but there are some unique ones uh, that, that only really apply to ground source so myth number one is that collector pipes have to be buried deep in the ground. Um, again, this is, a, this is a bit of a, a myth. I'm not quite sure where this one's come from. Um, but generally speaking, 
the the only limitation on the depth of the pipes is you obviously want to give them mechanical protection so you don't want somebody with their garden spade accidentally digging through the uh the the ground loop um so that's one reason why they tend to be buried around between one and 1 1.2 meters down um the second reason is you don't want them in the frost zone um so the top about 800 millimeters of soil um, will vary quite a lot in temperature throughout the course of the year. And um, that's why water mains are always buried at least 800 millimeters deep. Um, but as a general rule um, for ground source heat pumps, you would tend to put the pipes between one and 1.2 meters down. Um, you might ask why wouldn't you go deeper than 1.2 meters? Um, the main reason is, is that from a health and safety point of view, when you're installing the pipes into a trench, um, if you go deeper than 1.2 meters, you have to shore up the sides of the trench um, to prevent somebody being accidentally, uh, you know, buried if, in the case of a collapse. Um, and obviously that's quite an expensive thing to do. So just from a practicality point of view, almost all heat pump um, ground loops are um, put between 1 and 1.2 meters down. Um, myth number two is that collector pipes will freeze the ground. Um, and this is a this is something that can happen, um, but won't happen um, in a well sized system. So each type of ground, um, and this looks like a sort of fairly cl uh, clay type soil, which would probably be quite good for a heat pump. Each type of ground um, has a um, an extraction rate associated with it. So that's the rate at which you can pull energy from that ground and it will be able to recharge itself over the course of a year. Um, so the extraction rate varies not only on um, the type of soil and the type of ground that you've got, but also um, it varies with the amount of hours you're expecting the heat pump to run. And that's why it's quite important that you do an accurate heat loss assessment of the building you're serving and because if the heat pump runs for more hours than you're expecting, um, then you start pulling more energy from the ground than you might have been expecting to. And that's when you can start getting into, um, into issues with the ground freezing. However, if you size the ground loop correctly, um, you should never get to a point where the ground is freezing. Um, so you might then ask, well, why not just oversize every collector array that you put in? Um, so, you, you know, be doubly safe. And there are downsides to that as well, um, not least, uh, obviously, the cost of installation. Uh, as you increase the amount of ground um, loops that you put in, obviously, the cost of installation goes up. Um, but also, you end up with greater pumping losses as well, um, because obviously, you're pumping glycol through these loops. So the, the greater the size of the loop, the more your pump's having to work, which obviously, that has uh, an impact in terms of um, electrical efficiency. So you've got this balance between you don't want to undersize the system um, and end up with the ground freezing. And equally, you don't really want to oversize the system and end up with an inefficient, expensive um, system from that point of view. Uh, myth three is that lots of ground needs to be available. Well, I think we answered that with the boreholes. Um, so, yes, if you want uh, horizontal collectors, you're going to need quite a lot of ground, um, but you've always got the... Um, solution of, of boreholes as I said they're more expensive to install um, but they work particularly well um, in smaller sites um, we're seeing a lot of borehole installations around London now um, and we're also seeing um, borehole installations on some social housing projects where they're installing um, ground source heat pumps um, and boreholes are always the go-to for any kind of large commercial project um, simply because of the amount of land area that would otherwise be required Myth number four is that ground source heat pumps create really high electricity bills. Um, again, this isn't true. I think this probably comes from um, systems where a ground source heat pump's been installed um, and then poorly commissioned, um, and that can lead to higher electricity bills. Um, and probably the other thing is that people look at the electricity bill and they say, right, well, my electricity bill's gone from x to y and it's increased since i got rid of my gas boiler but what they forget is of course they're not now paying for their gas boiler anymore so um so they they can knock off what they would have been paying on gas and um, so overall 
Um, yes, electricity bills will go up if you replace a gas boiler with a with a heat pump because you're no longer paying for gas, you're paying for electricity instead. Um, but overall, the, the total cost of energy um, should be significantly lower with a ground source heat pump when compared to um, a, an, a the, the gas bill for a, a gas boiler. And myth number five is that they're so expensive, you'll never get your money back. Um, if you, without things like the RHI scheme, um, this may have an element of truth to it. Ground source heat pumps can be quite expensive to install. However, one thing we do know is that uh, government policy is pushing us towards um, green energy and towards electrical heating. And so it's likely that over the next few years, um, the cost of gas will rise um, quite significantly and the cost of electricity in real terms will stabilise or may fall. Um, so we think that, um, that the payback for these types of systems will continue to get better. Um, obviously, projects that are being installed at the moment, you also get the government RHI assistance. So domestic RHI, which pays um, a sum of money to, to the householder each year for the first seven years after installation. And the idea of that uh, payment is it offsets the additional capital cost of installing um, either a ground source or an air source heat pump. OK, so now we're going to look at some of the risks and opportunities associated with heat pumps. Obviously, um, the whole kind of idea of this um, of this presentation is to talk to you about why you may or may not want to install a heat pump on your next project. So let's have a look at some of the risks and opportunities. So here's a, a lovely um, Georgian style house. Um, I'm sure uh, some of the architects here will be able to tell me um, a lot more about the architectural details on this than I can I can know. But um, but what are the opportunities for a, a retrofit installation like this? Well, first of all, there is always the opportunity to lower running costs over the equivalent um, gas or potentially oil system that that would be, be well, that would be being replaced um, by a, an air, an air, ground source or air source heat pump. Um, you'd increase the EPC rating for the home. Um, you'd obviously get the opportunity to modernise in, ageing infrastructure. Um, a lot of the buildings that we see um, where there's retrofit going on um, have quite antiquated heating systems. And really, it's a question of the heating system is coming to the end of its life anyway. Um, what are we going to do? We're we going to replace like for like, so replace an old oil boiler for a newer one, or are we going to make a leap into a new technology such as a heat pump? Um, obviously, it gives you resilience against rising fuel prices. So, what are the downsides? What are the potential risks? What are the things we've got to mitigate against? Well, first of all, the first thing to do is let's try and make sure that the building is as well insulated as possible. This goes back to the energy hierarchy we talked about right at the start of the presentation. Let's make the building as well insulated as possible. So that could mean double glazing. Um, you know, obviously, a lot of these buildings may be listed. Um, so there may be only very small tweaks that you can make. Um, but sometimes things like loft insulation might be something that you could do quite quite easily and and be very effective um you know a lot of heat is lost through loft spaces um a lot of heat is lost through um poorly glazed um windows you know even things like draft excluders can make a huge difference um to the energy performance of a building the next thing is to mitigate against um insufficient or inappropriate heat emitter sizing so typically, if this building had been heated by an oil or gas boiler, um, then the system would have been designed to operate around a 70 or possibly even 80 degree flow temperature in the system. Um, and if the heat emitters were correctly sized, if you then put a heat pump onto that system, it's unlikely that the output from those existing radiators is going to be sufficient. So the solution is to upgrade the radiators with newer, high efficiency radiators with a greater surface area. So you get the same heat output from a lower flow temperature. The lower flow temperature then improves the COP of the heat pump and hence you get your you get a better um, running cost. 
Um, it may be that the heat pump is incompatible with the existing pipework infrastructure. Um, usually that's something that can be fairly easily um, dealt with. Um, it may be that you'll need to put a, a buffer tank or something in to, um, to work around that. Um, but in particular, if you've got a very old system, um, something like a single pipe um, central heating system, then it might be that there'll need to be some um, pipe work infrastructure done. And then you're really getting into quite a significant um, refit of the plumbing system. That's not to say it's not worth doing, it's just that you need to apportion some cost to that. Um, obviously, I've already talked about, uh, about drafts. You know, that really comes back down to the, um, the energy hierarchy again. Um, air infiltration is a big, uh, big loser of heat. Um, so obviously you want to get the ventilation levels right, um, but excessive ventilation, um, especially where you don't have an MVHR system, um, and an MVHR system is unlikely to be a good investment for, for an older property like this, um, then that's where you need to start thinking about drafts and leakage. Um, and just and you know build right ventilate uh, build tight ventilate right as the old saying goes and finally insufficient plant room space um this particular property is likely to have some sort of boiler room um because some of the older plant that would have been installed originally is probably quite bulky um but you just need to obviously make sure that you've allowed sufficient plant space um especially if you've got a heat pump um with a with a buffer cylinder and a large domestic hot water cylinder that you know you can start taking up a fair bit of space and finally the electricity supply and this is probably the one that trips people up most often um with retrofit properties um they think yeah we're going to do a heat pump and a simple calculation at the outset um of this is the electricity supply we've currently got this is a diversity calculation. This is all the things that we're using in the house, all the electrical devices um, that we're using. Add a heat pump onto that. Is the electricity supply still going to be able to cope with this additional large load being placed upon it? And um, sometimes you will need um, to upgrade to a three phase power supply. Um, the time to start looking on retrofit is if you're getting a house with a gross internal floor area of around 300 square meters that's when you should be really starting to think carefully about will you need a three-phase power supply or an upgrade to the existing single-phase power supply and um, some older properties also only have um, 60 amp uh, single-phase power supplies um, but generally speaking the dno will upgrade that to 100 amp um, at very low cost um, but if you if a hundred amp power supply, hundred amp single phase power supply isn't sufficient, then you may need to go up to a um, to a three phase supply. Okay. So, what about new builds? Well, the good thing is that there are probably more opportunities with new build um, because it's likely you're going to have the very high levels of insulation that really, really suit um, a heat pump perfectly um, from the outset. Um, it is also true that buildings that have renewable technologies integrated into them tend to be more valuable um, than those that don't. Um, and some quite interesting research um, that's come out of the United States um, suggests that um, the office buildings, for example, that have uh, high energy efficiency levels um, tend to have higher um, tenants, uh, they, they tend to retain tenants better and have a higher occupancy uh, rate um, as well. Um, obviously gives you resilience against higher rising fuel prices. Although to be honest, if you can build a house that has almost no energy demand in the first place, of course, that gives you even better resilience because you're not relying on fuel in the first place. And of course, it really helps with things like REBA 2030. Um, you, you know, there are really quite strict um, energy efficiency targets within the REBA 2030, um, as well as things like indoor air quality and, and water and all the other things that, it, that go along with it. Um, passive house also is, is obviously, a, it looks very closely at energy consumption. So what are the risks? 
Well, the biggest risks are um, that people design a building around a boiler and then at the last moment they decide to go to a heat pump and they haven't considered all the other implications of that, so they've got the heat emitter sizing wrong. Um, people quite often will try and over um, engineer buildings um, because they've seen, you know, five different technologies and they think, well, I'll throw them all at one building and, and you know, is, you know, more is better. And often um, it's, it's really not. Um, sometimes, you know, keep it simple um, and, and use, you know, a small selection of the best technologies for that particular building rather than, rather than throwing everything at it. Um, people quite often waste money um, on plant that's, that's bigger than it needs to be. Um, because they haven't followed the energy hierarchy and actually they could have put a smaller, um, more efficient system in if they just maybe just improved the insulation in a few places in a few key areas. And they've um, not uh, looked at the, the future of the development. You know, is there is there likely to be a phase two of this building? You know, are they going to put an additional outhouse on or something? And you could then start thinking about putting some of that infrastructure in place up front um, rather than doing it in a, a piecemeal way. And finally, as we've said before, electricity supply size. Um, again, it's, you know, with new builds, if you're getting a new supply put in, um, you know, consider, you know, electric vehicles, you know, they're coming. So it might be that if it's a large house, you may have two or three electric vehicles. And if you are running two or three electric vehicle charging points, you're going to, that's going to be quite a, hefty amount of electricity you've got your heat pump on top of that maybe you're putting a swimming pool in and you're heating that with electric as well you know all these things can quite quickly add up and um, so just consider that electricity supply size and get the correct size supply run in um early early in this proceedings and um, it's much better to have a three-phase power supply and not use um, its full potential than it is to have a single phase power supply which is running at its limit and then when you want to add additional um, plants in the future you know new EV charger or something like that and you can't do it. So finally let's look at the big do's and don'ts. So here's the big tick of the items so for all heat pumps these apply whether it's ground source or air source. Heat pumps work absolutely brilliantly when you've got really good, really energy efficient building fabric. If you can get the air infiltration rate down to less than 10 meters cubed per meter squared per hour, that's always one that trips me up, uh, a bit of a tongue twister, um, then so much the better. Obviously in new build buildings, you should be looking to try and get well below five. Um, and when you start getting down to the three, kind of level then MVHR then you know really um, becomes a must um, but it also you know starts paying you back huge amounts of money. Um, if you can use underfloor heating so much the better. Underfloor heating uses lower flow temperatures, lower flow temperatures better for the COP of the heat pump. When you should you think about using an, an, um, an air source heat pump um, well, certainly if plant space is limited, um, because you can start, if you look at a monoblock air source heat pump, a lot of the, um, uh, all the internal, the, all the heat pump gubbins is in the external unit. Um, air source heat pumps tend to work really well in smaller buildings, and maybe less than 300 square meters. Um, when we do the uh, cost comparisons um, of air source against ground source, usually with buildings that are less than 300 square meters, um, air source tends to come out a bit better. Um, on larger buildings, then it starts becoming a bit more even and sometimes um, ground source um, can come out better. What really makes a difference um, with the air source, ground source debate um, on larger buildings is um, whether you're wanting to do cooling as well. Um, obviously, we'd say, you know, try and design out the requirement for cooling. But if you, if you do end up with a cooling requirement, then sometimes ground source can be a little bit better. Um, and um, with the RHI payments. Um, and if you've got a summer use um, swimming pool, um, then make sure, then, then um, an air source is a really, really good um, 
uh, solution for that. Um, ground source, as I said, tends to work really well with indoor swimming pools where you're using the pool year round. Air source, really good in uh, outdoor pools where you're using it just in the summer. So things to do with ground source, um, make sure you've left enough space for the internal plant. Um, ground source heat pumps, you know, they can take up a bit of space. Um, so about eight square meters uh, is, is really a sort of should, what should be considered a minimum. Uh, they tend to work better with larger buildings and with larger buildings come larger electricity supplies. Um, so tend, you know, although you can get single phase ground source heat pumps, um, it's always a good idea to um, look at whether three phase is, um, is going to be required. And if you're going for horizontal collectors, as a rough rule of thumb, you're going to want to have at least three times the gross internal floor area of land available for those collectors to go into. Now, don't just think that you're going to take the, the house and measure the whole plot and think, right, OK, I can put, you know, I've got just enough space to three times the gross internal floor area. Because if you've got, um, you know, trees of TPOs, for example, you can't go into the root zone um, with the, with the uh, ground loops. Um, you've got to think about, you know, is there going to be some sort of uh, future um, hard standing or anything over any of this this land because again that land again couldn't be used for horizontal collectors so it's available land not just land that's there so the big don'ts so times when heat pumps really don't work that well is if you've got a very poorly insulated building um, you will you know heat pumps can work in those buildings um, but generally speaking you won't get the best efficiencies so again, go back to the energy hierarchy, try and improve the building as much as you can before you start putting the, the technology in. If the building um, feels drafty or has open chimneys, um, that would tend to indicate that it's got a very, very high um, uh, ventilation rate uh, or uh, infiltration rate. Um, and so what you want to do is try and reduce that infiltration rate down to something uh, where you've got less energy loss um, before you start installing technology. Um, if you've got older radiators, um, then it may you may need to think about replacing those. Um, so just, just be careful. And um, where internal plant space doesn't allow for a hot water cylinder. So I think we've talked about this already, but obviously there's no equivalent of a combi um, boiler for in, in a heat pump. So you will always need a hot water cylinder. So just make sure you've allowed space for that. And something called microbore heating pipe work. Um, so that's very, very small diameter pipe work that was popular in the kind of thing. It was about the mid 80s. It was popular for a little while. Um, but unfortunately, because of the higher flow rates um, of water that you're going to require uh, with a heat pump, uh, microbore doesn't work very well. And if you want lots of high temperature hot water, um, uh, this would be more for things like care homes, that kind of thing. Um, you might want to think about um, combining a heat pump for the space heating with maybe some sort of um, uh, gas powered uh, clarifier for the hot water. Um, but, you know, for normal houses, for normal domestic hot water consumption, um, just just use the heat pump. And when shouldn't you use a, a, um, a heat pump? Well, uh, air source, if you've got a very, very sensitive uh, noise environment, and then it might be worth um, considering, you know, if you're right on the edge of a, a nature reserve or something, or you've got particularly fussy neighbors, or you've got a space where, where there's going to be lots of reverberation because there's only hard surfaces around, um, then, then that might be worth avoiding. And you need to make sure you've got very good ventilation to the outdoor fan unit. So um, you can't put fan units, for example, in courtyards um, because you get something called cold welling. So when should, shouldn't you use a ground source? Um, obviously, the capital cost of installing a ground source is higher than air source, although the running costs are slightly lower. So if project budgets are particularly tight, um, then it might not be a good idea. Um, think about it if, if obviously the electricity supply is not up to scratch um, or if the cost of upgrade to a three phase supply that might may be required is going to be particularly high. And if there's no land available to put the collectors in, 
Um, although, as I said, um, with boreholes, you've got a pretty good um, solution for most situations. So to summarize everything I've said in this presentation in just a few points, think about those myths and, uh, you know, most of them have some sort of element of truth to them. So analyze the thermal performance of the existing buildings really thoroughly. Make sure you understand the myths. Make sure you understand when you should and shouldn't use the heat pump. Be aware of any wider limitations um, and make sure you maximize the opportunities and minimize the risks of every project. Focus on improving the building rather than a straight like for like heating system. So think about the energy hierarchy. Always go back to the energy hierarchy first. So start with insulating, improving the building, then start thinking about technology. And just remember, it may be that in some circumstances, the heat pump just isn't the right fit. So this last slide um, just tells you a little bit about what mesh energy do um, and where we can get involved. So a feasibility stage, um, you know, rebuild stages one and two and, and to some extent three, that's where we'd get involved with just doing some very basic um, outline um, feasibility studies, making, you know, doing that sort of initial selection of, you know, should we look at ground source? Should we look at air source? Um, should we look at, um, at a different, you know, what other technologies would suit, would complement this? Um, so, you know, would solar PV work really well? Would solar thermal work really well with this particular um, installation? Um, do we need some, some sort of energy manager? Um, do we want to be exporting to batteries, for example? Then full M and E packages, and um, then finally uh, so at stage four. Then tender review, project oversight at stage five and six, and then finally at stage seven. So the post occupancy stage, um, energy monitoring, feeding back, so that, that so that on the next following projects you can learn from what's happened in previous projects. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, I'm hoping there'll be a few questions. Um, so let me just find the chat box, um, which always takes me longer than it should do because I can never remember where it is. Chat, there we go. Okay. So just going, just going back up to the top. Um, so uh, Robert asks, in terms of locating the heat pump externally, I assumed closest system to the water tank, the better in terms of efficiency. Yes, absolutely, Rob. Um, spot on. Um, it is always better to have uh, as short pipe runs as possible between the heat pump and um, the inside um, system, um, whether that's on an air source, um, a split air source system, um, so one where you've got a refrigerant going between the two units, or whether it's a monoblock system. So where you have water going between the um, uh, outside unit and the inside. Um, but yes, it is always better. Um, the other thing to take into account is cost. So the highly insulated pipe that you'd use to go between and at the exterior unit and the internal unit um, of a monoblock system, um, it's about hundred pounds a meter. So just, you know, so you, you can, you know, add in a thousand pounds worth of cost uh, or a couple of thousand pounds worth of cost fairly quickly. Um, if you're not careful. Uh, second question comes from Alex. Uh, what about high temperature heat pumps? Um, can they do better hot, uh, hotter hot water? Um, yes, you can get uh, high temperature heat pumps that can do hotter hot water. Um, uh, the only downside with those is that not all of them are listed on the RHI. So you have to be a little bit careful. Um, a lot of the newer heat pumps um, that are coming out, which use uh, the propane refrigerant, the number of which I can't remember which it is, um, uh, will um, do hot water up to about 60 degrees C anyway. Um, but for most cases, you, you know, the temperature of water you actually want to use at the point of use is never going to want to be really more than about 45 degrees. Um, so as long as you can store water at 46, 47, 48 degrees, that's fine. It obviously might get a small 
temperature drop between the uh, the cylinder and the tap. Um, but you don't ever actually really need hot water coming out of the tap at 60. Um, from a thermal disinfection point of view for Legionella, uh, you would then just run a thermal disinfection cycle once a week um, to, to cope with that. Um, but yes, there are there are high temperature air source heat pumps and high temperature ground source heat pumps as well. Um, so the next question is um, from Richard. And he asks, for retrofit radiator applications, although you may upsize the radiators, is there also a consideration of pipe lagging to minimize wasted heat on the pipe runs? Um, Yes, there is. Um, the other place to think about um, about waste heat uh, from pipe runs is if you have, well, on domestic hot water, uh, especially if you've got um, recirculation, um, because obviously any heat that you lose in that recirculation line um, then has to be picked up again by the heat pump. Um, but the, the, the other place to think about um, uh, getting hot spots is when you have lots of pipes coming back to an underfloor heating manifold. Um, so sometimes you need to insulate those pipes as well, um, because you may have um, a local hotspot around where the manifold is for the underfloor. Um, Rob asks, uh, can you use heat pumps for cooling? Pros and cons on this. Um, Rob, there, if you look on our YouTube channel, I actually did my last um, last masterclass was on cooling from heat pumps um, and that goes through all that in quite a lot of detail uh, so rather than trying to answer what I answered in a sort of hour long um, thing in in a few seconds I will refer you to that video if that's okay um, if you drop me an email I, I can send you a link um, next question is also from Rob uh, controls and program what's the best approach could uh, temp set point only for high insulated uh, home work um, so generally speaking with heat pumps you would tend to have the heat the system running or on all the time and then you'd probably have a setback temperature at night um, a heat pump will generally be sized to meet the design temperature heat loss so when it's typically say minus two outside in the in England um, which would be around about the design temperature, you would size the heat pump to meet the heat load at that at that temperature. Um, so there's not a huge amount of oversizing in a heat pump to allow you to sort of do the quick heat up that you might get with a boiler. Typically boilers are quite oversized, um, so you get that that ability to heat the system up and then and then allow the building to go cold again and then heat it up again quickly. Um, that's why heat pumps aren't necessarily always the best option if you've got something like a village hall um, where the uh, use is quite intermittent. Um, there's some uh, there's something which um, can heat the space up much more quickly uh, might be more appropriate um, and we can talk about that at another time. Uh, can you use SAP or Passive House uh, to size heat pump system or do you need to room by room calcs? Uh, we would always recommend using a room by room calculator. Um, and the one we tend to use or the system we use is IESVE. Um, we build a full um, 3D model of the, of the building. Um, you can also do static heat losses um, manually, uh, which is another system we use from time to time. Uh, we tend to use the IES system because it allows us to do lots of other things and it allows us to um, model different uh, systems and um, heat emitters and all kinds of other things and and look at the whole system dynamically. Um, but it also allows us to do cooling and all kinds of other stuff. 